Okay, we are this live cool. with Jesse Berger. I know that is good, right? Jesse Berger, Greg Foss, and Mike. Mike, how do I pronounce your last name? Weeb. Mike Weeb. Mike can apparently drive the golf ball further than me, which I'm shocked because I can slice that thing. I was just saying 180 <laughs> yards. So I'm surprised you can beat that. But we'll get into that in a little bit. And I just wanted to share with everybody this isn't actually even our podcast anymore because Greg just sends out a text saying, hey, it's time for me to come back and we're blessed and honored to have you back. So I'm just having fun with this. Yeah, but Greg sends, sends a message mm -hmm. over saying, hey, it's time for me to come back on the podcast. And by the way, I'm bringing over Jesse with me and I'm bringing Mike with me. And of course, we just agree. So Mike, I don't even know a lot about you. So we have to learn about you on this podcast. But before we get into that, Greg, what's going on with the Fossmobile? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I don't know if I've mentioned it on the podcast here before, but uh I, I have tweeted about it. My great, great uncle actually founded and, and designed the first automobile, gas powered automobile in Sherbrooke, Quebec in the early 1900s. And it was such a successful vehicle that Henry Ford actually called him up and said, I want to go in business with you. And my uncle said, no, it's not going to catch on. Okay. And the reason he didn't think it would catch on is because in Sherbrooke, Quebec in the wintertime, they didn't plow the streets because the horse could pull the sleigh through the streets, but they did plow the sidewalks. So my uncle had to drive his car on the sidewalks and people were like throwing snowballs at him and all this stuff. So he only built one of these cars and literally it was good enough that Henry Ford wanted to go into business with him. So he says no, which is fine. I mean, we missed a little there, but the truth is they're, re, uh, they're building a tribute mobile to him just up in Milton and they've just finished building this Foss mobile. And it's actually a beautiful r rendition of a 19... And so who's they? Is it some... At Auto Works. So my uncle, his name is... Um, uh, hold on one sec. I'm the, sure. the regulator is really, really but You're really close with your uncle well, there, Greg. He, you got to look up Honestly, his... I... I uh, the regulators are going to love I knew it when was... he drives on the sidewalk. So his name is Ron Foss. So here he is. Executive Director... Foss Mobile Enterprises, and he's in Burlington, Ontario. There's a there's a, a little. I have pictures of it, but wow. that's the logo of the Foss Mobile. All right. So here's the story, though. Everyone, don't overthink things. My uncle, great great uncle, said, "No, no. You know, you can't drive your your uh, your car on the sidewalk. So I don't want to produce a uh, an automobile. Uh, it's never going to catch on. So I guess drawing the parallel to uh, people that say, uh, you know. Uh, Bitcoin, it's used for money laundering, it's used for pornography, it's used for the drug trade. I will remind everybody, they said exactly the same thing about the internet in the 1990s, okay? The internet was used for pornography, it was used for uh, illicit drug trade or nefarious. Um, and here we are, we're at Bitcoin uh, with an ETF just announced in the US with all sorts of opportunity. Launching today, no? The, the first one will start trading today. That's correct. And not that facts matter or anything anymore, but um, didn't, wasn't there a report by like a former FBI director saying that maybe 1% of Bitcoin is used for illicit activity? That was, it could that was be, like six months ago. That's fair. Like that. And, and you know, what is the currency of, of use for, uh, is US dollar cash, right? It's, it's used for most... Uh, nefarious purposes uh that's fine is yeah. it true that there's cocaine traces of co cocaine on most uh, u.s dollar bills i don't know but it's it, it's a you know a urban urban uh yeah, myth well, who knows yeah well we know that trillions of dollars are laundered through the legacy monetary systems right. that's the preferred means of laundering money right so, so anyway here's mike yeah, uh, yeah, let's let's let's, let's move <laughs> over let's let's talk about mike i have golfed with him it is true the man can hit the ball he was what what were you top ranked in the top set, uh, 10 uh, long drive players in the world um and go ahead tell us uh, yeah, how do you get into that mike uh so i'm an alberta boy um oh shit so you're like a, what an oilers fan no flames fan actually i'm oddly enough i'm a flyers fan so uh, i get oh, just as geez. much flack for that but yeah, um, no you should <laughs> <laughs> but so I grew up in small town Alberta and hitting the ball a long way was just something I did as a kid and it was like oh this is cool I'm in my you know teens or whatever I'm hitting the ball in decent ways and then uh, I'm watching these long drive competitions on TV and the winner gets like a Chrysler LeBaron and stuff like that right the early 90s and I'm like that looks really cool you know these guys are hitting it you know 350 or whatever I'm like this looks like a lot of fun sure enough mid 90s rolls around and I, my mom's calling me. She's like frantic. I'm at a golf tournament somewhere. She's like, 
uh, a Canadian just won the U.S. national long drive thing, which is what we used to watch on TV. I'm like, wow, there's got to be a way to get into this now, right? So mm-hmm. I actually go to that dude's hometown. The guy's name's Jason Zubak, long drive legend. And I go to his hometown to do a qualifier and beat up on the locals and just got into it. And so I started, I moved out here because there are more qualifiers in proximity to Toronto. And um, first year at Worlds, finished in the top uh, top eight and just took off. When was there. that? So this is like two, 2000. Wow. Yeah. So now you can still hit the ball? I, Do you still compete in this thing? I don't compete anymore, no. But when you go golfing, you just impress your friends by smashing But not only that, he, he, I, he's got soft hands around the green, so he'll shoot. <laughs> he'll, 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 no, he'll shoot, uh, what, scratch, right? Yeah, I mean. Plus or minus two. few over. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. no, it's uh, yeah. I went, go, I go golfing about once a year. I shot, I think, like 121, and I was just sharing that, like, that was with including mulligans, just in case anyone <laughs> saw. Yeah, I get you get really bad. I think the best I've ever shot was like a 99. I just don't golf, so you, you're a scratch golfer. And then, Foss, what are you? I'm horrible, yeah. uh, and uh, that being said, uh, I can uh, I can shoot in the 80s. Uh, but this year, I can also shoot in the hundreds. So that's golf, and right? And then Jesse? I'm just trying to break 100. I just don't want yeah, to be yeah, in triple digits. Yeah, just yeah, keep yeah. me in double digits. So as we go through this, Mike, uh, what is your story? How did you get down? What are you doing in Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin world right now? How did you get started with that? So uh, four years ago, um, we we were, you know, my brother and I, who I'm close with, he's golf with these guys. Um, we're close in age. Um, so... Uh, we were, we started watching shows. We're seeing like you know zeitgeist documentaries. We're seeing stuff on how um, broken the current system is, and then we start watching the um, internet money uh, show, the Mike Maloney stuff. Like oh yeah, the on gold silver. Yeah, 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 right. And he mentions Bitcoin, and so we're like, oh, that's interesting. And the funny thing is, is that it's even funnier that I was already. I had already dabbled in getting a wallet, buying some Bitcoin, and using it for some, you know, sketchy kind of business or whatever, because they required Bitcoin. So I had some, and this is well after I'd heard about it at two hundred fifty dollars. And at that time, I was like, oh, it's like a, you know, I'm thinking of it like a stock, right? Two fifty. Oh, it's so expensive. Like I could afford maybe two shares, and mm-hmm. maybe it'll double in a few years. I've missed the boat, right? And so. I get into it. I started buying it. You know, it was like six fifty. I'm using it for whatever. Still didn't understand it. And then we started watching that series, and all of a sudden, the the light bulb just went off. And thankfully, we still had, or I still had, some money left over from the sale of a house that we had together. And so, what was left, I put you know a decent chunk in. This is going you know whatever, just before seventeen. So, um, no money since then. And then just sat on it, got into some trading stuff, earned a bit more. And uh, I would say over the last year or so is when I really got fully orange pilled, where I had that conversation about, should I keep my condo and rent it out? Oh, shit. And then get another one. Uh, and my parents like, yes, that's the move. And then so I'm talking to my brother and he's like, OK, well, let's think about this. You know, do you what's the best case scenario for you know, your property in the next five years. I'm like, well, maybe it's going to double. What do you think? What do you think Bitcoin's going to do? I'm like, it's going to double before the end of the year. <laughs> Simple math, right? So sold the condo, put it all into Bitcoin and has just been going full blast um, this year. So started doing my call that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. So what are you doing every Friday? You do a call every Monday night. Oh, sorry. Every Monday. I was way off on that. <laughs> every Friday. Every Friday. Every, every, Friday, we'll every, every Monday night. Yeah. What do you do on Monday nights? I just have an open Zoom call, uh, which I've been doing all year long. Um, I've had anywhere from five people to 75 people. And um, I had Jesse on the call, other, you know, guests on the call. And uh, Greg, you have to come on. No, I, I was just thinking. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you're just educating about Bitcoin. That's it. Just talking about Bitcoin. So it's kind of like I'm, you know, as I'm learning, I'm just 
trying to bring people along with Okay, this me is interesting for, for me because I, I feel like Jesse and Greg are in different, doing different things. What, the people coming on your call, what's the number one thing they don't understand or the question they have? Because I feel like Greg's teaching people about like the credit contagion and you know, the the fiat, the melting fiat, like he's, his the level of conversation is kind of super high. Jesse's written a book that covers A to Z on the thing. No. What are you hearing from people who jump on your call? So, Primarily, my call is full of straight up newbies, yeah. right? And so, you know, with the Telegram group that I've got, it was the most basic info that I could find on Bitcoin, like literally straightforward um, and trying to distill as much info that I'm absorbing and just funnel it to new people so that it's digestible for mm -hmm. them. And so when um, when I when my brother started talking about Greg and then because your uh, brother knew Greg through Jesse? Uh, I think no? you guys met on Twitter. Yeah, for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, on Twitter. Twitter. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so they met on Twitter. And then and then when we started chatting, Greg had mentioned Jesse's book on a podcast. So I'm, li I'm listening to podcasts all the time. I'm listening to Greg. I can't remember which. I think it was Marty Bent okay. that you were on with. And you mentioned Jesse's uh, being local and, and having a book. I'm like, I got to reach out to Jesse. So Jesse agreed to come on my call. We had a nice, you know, group, um, you yeah, know, good turnout. We had a great chat. Yeah. And uh, so it's some weeks I've got a guest on. Other weeks I'm playing a four-minute video on how the Lightning Network works. Oh, nice. Um, and so then are you trying to get people to understand that this is something they should put some of their savings in? What's your goal when you're introducing it to people? So initially uh, what was happening or how this sort of came to be was I got involved with um, a currency trading platform that paid in Bitcoin. And that was the only reason why I wanted to do it. And because I just wanted to grow my stack. And so as, as this started to grow, I end up with this huge team of people and by far the the bulk of the questions or issues that were people were having were how to get a wallet how to mm -hmm. buy bitcoin how to move it around yeah. so i ended up dedicating one night just to bitcoin questions not trading and everything else aside and so when the platform kind of went on hold while they roll out another phase i just kept going with the bitcoin call got it and so now i've been doing that all year and it's Primarily newbies, some people sort of have a general concept of it, don't know too many of the particulars. So I get, you know, different people to come on and um, just Q&A so people can get a feel for what's going on, do some news updates, just a little bit of everything. Yeah. Uh, nothing too hardcore, but it's, it is geared for newbies. I can't believe there's so many uh, different people talking about Bitcoin right now. Like so. Jesse's so different, Greg's so different, Mike, you're so different. We're all trying to share this message in our own unique voices. Right. Like this to me it's is going, a, it's going to the highest levels. Right. So I don't know if I told you guys this. I did share it uh, <clears throat> on a podcast with Jeff Booth, but I'm not even sure it's dropped yet. Uh, I gave a Zoom call to 45 members of parliament, Canadian members of parliament. Wow. Really? One, one party. Right. OK. Uh, Last week. I wonder wow. which one. How, Last did, week. So how did that go? Tell us. Uh, like, I'll what, just what were tell the questions? you. They yeah. were remarkably good questions. Uh, I will tell you that I believe that Bitcoin could become an election mm -hmm. uh, issue. And it, it would be huge. It damn well should be. So the Alberta, the local MPs from Alberta, I shouldn't say local, the MPs from Alberta particularly like the energy aspect of it. Uh, there's carbon trading. There's all sorts of stuff that Canada could be a world leader in. Man. And uh, this was one political party. Um, I will say that it won't surprise you who it was. I don't want to uh, dox anybody, but uh, it's very encouraging. Why would the government give up control? And I, I'm, I'm just curious in what capacity Bitcoin would, because I obviously would want that. Mm -hmm. But if I'm the other side of this argument, why would any government give up the control of a printing press? So I guess their acceptance because of Bitcoin of it, might be might not be as a monetary standard. It might just be introducing it in no. some capacity. Okay, it's inevitable that fiat will fail. Okay, that's pure math. They always have failed. So smart people will accomplish what's called a network transfer. You're going to have a checking account, which is going to be your fiat 
currency account, and you're going to have a savings account, which is going to be Bitcoin. And there's a network transfer taking place in front of us, and smart politicians realize that. And the first country to move of the G7 will be the best off in the G7, much like El Salvador being a Central American country moving. I joked on this call. I said, you know, and I have a French-Canadian wife, and I said, with all due respect to the French-Canadian politicians on this call, including my French-Canadian wife, uh, we should probably learn Spanish in Canada because there's there will be a flippening where Central American countries will be more rich than Canada if we don't get our acting gear. We have zero gold, Tom. We oh, sold trust a, me, I know. We, sold, we okay. actually, I think, have 71 so, so, ounces. So I think we have 71. But listen, listen. <laughs> but, but, personal, but Canadians personally, whether it's through the stock market, right, because there's a lot of gold mining stocks in our, in our market or whether they own gold personally, that's a different story. The, the government... They're going to blow all our money anyway. But C Canadians do Smart have some gold. Smart governments will plan for a network transfer where you can enrich your citizens by being a first mover. Very simply. Yeah. And you think the politicians, this is fascinating to me. So you think the politicians were digesting this, that they were understanding? Because I think what you're saying we all have to learn Spanish because... Central. It was a joke. No, I know. I know it was. But, a, but no, like, I know it was a like, joke. But that was the message you were trying to make that there's going to be some first movers there in Canada. Should if, pay attention. Okay, so we need to understand how bad our financial situation in Canada is for to begin with. Okay, full stop. We are going to be the first G7 nation to default on our debt. Okay, the CDS credit default swap market is telling us this right now. We have an idiot prime minister who says stuff like monetary policy doesn't matter. And secondly, budgets will balance themselves. Now, listen, if, if, if he was the CEO of a publicly traded company, he'd be fired on the spot, right? I mean, you, you, don't, mm -hmm. don't, you don't joke around about this stuff. So we have horrible management. We have an incredibly ballooning debt burden. And we have people that don't understand that you cannot print your way to prosperity. There is a party that understands. So you shared that type of message? Absolutely. And you think- I told were, them, here's what I told yeah. them. Like I tell everyone, when I started working at the Royal Bank of Canada in 1988, it was insolvent, bankrupt. It sort of hit some people upside the head. What do you mean? Our beautiful Royal Bank of Canada, world-renowned bank, was insolvent? And I say, yeah, because so was every single other money center bank in the world because of Latin American debt. And it sort of shocks some people. How is that? And you go, well, a bank is 25 times leveraged. Do you think you could run a business with 25 times leverage? Well, what? a bank is 25 times okay, leveraged. One more thing for you. So what would be the first move if you were running the country to introduce Bitcoin into this country in some capacity? I would what? get the energy sector to embrace the gift that China has provided us by banning Bitcoin mining and essentially trying to control capital by banning cryptocurrencies in China as well. So think about it from two respects. We have incredible natural resources, okay? We have, we are an energy exporter. What if we start pricing Bitcoin or energy in Bitcoin? Not gonna happen in a, in a country that endorses the petrodollar system, which in itself is a little conflicted, but it's gonna happen in Russia. So there was a fake news report today that Russia had bought 1.4 billion of Bitcoin for their sovereign fund doesn't change the fact that Putin has already looked at pricing oil trades in crypto and obviously Bitcoin because Bitcoin is digital energy. It's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so just on that point, for people who don't understand, what, what's the benefit to Russia pricing their energy in Bitcoin as opposed to U.S. dollars? U.S. dollar is worth zero. Why sell valuable natural resources for a fiat currency that's going to debase and ultimately U.S. Treasury bonds, which are the stupidest investment right now that I've ever seen in 30 years of trading, US, uh, of trading bonds. Why would you hold U.S. Treasuries on your balance sheet? Why wouldn't you sell valuable natural resources for digital energy? Okay, so Canada then says, okay, we're going to use some of our energy resources and start mining Bitcoin with some of the excess energy that's blown off and some of our Correct. energy, okay? Yeah. We are in a central banking system as part of the G7 mm -hmm. that would absolutely, uh, by the way, I'm for what you're saying, yeah. but we are in a central banking system as part of the G7 that would absolutely have a conniption if Canada starts moving towards some kind of Bitcoin standard in any way. Don't you think? 
No. And remember, no. I'm they, for they, what you're okay, saying. Okay, but okay, a conniption. Uh, so the ship is sinking, and we're supposed to s- stay on the ship and go down with the ship just because someone else says stay on the ship? I don't think so. I don't live for that type of government. And uh, sorry, I've talked a lot here, guys. Uh, let's speak no. up. All you See, have to do, if you have politicians that are talking about it, that's good. This this is exactly why, right? When I I, I signed, we gave away a whole bunch of the books that I signed here, right? What, what did I sign each of the books? Do you remember what I signed? I don't know. It's a, choose your money wisely, right? It It's about choice, right? If you recognize that the ship is sinking, you can wait for the government to tell you, okay, now it's okay to get in the lifeboat. We, we approve of the lifeboat. Or... Just do it yourself. Make up your mind. Mike sold his condo, hopped in the lifeboat. But yeah. Also, and then bringing it back to government, though, there's differences between municipal government, state government, provincial government, and federal government. Okay, so you can have Alberta, which has wanted to separate from Canada for an awful long time. Um, I'm I not see, saying I, I want them, them to jumping separate. on board for of sure. Course. Look, they, yeah. own, they own all the energy, well, yeah, why not? all the natural yeah, resources. Agreed. Are you kidding me? Why yeah. don't they just put Bitcoin in their treasury and start amassing agreed. Bitcoin and be the richest? I'm you know. just looking at the blowback because I want all this to happen. Okay. And personally, we can all, to Jesse's point and to what Mike's helping people do, I think we can all hone, be on our own Bitcoin standard today. That's for 100%. Yeah, 100%, 100% sir. we all know that. But, but at the government level, I'm just thinking, holy shit, because in my understanding of history, wars break out over monetary policy. So if Canada was to do something, I just think of that as, I remember, I want this to happen. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking, geez, this is, this is almost a... Well, you're wrong. Respectfully, you're wrong. Yeah. And so are people who overthink it, okay? Is the US gonna invade Canada? Uh, it wouldn't be a long war, uh, let's put it that way. But at the end of the day, I, that is not going to happen. When you have senators like Cynthia Loomis, when you have mayors and, and Ted Cruz in Texas, and it's happening in the U.S., state by state, yeah. it's going to happen. Why should it not be like that in Canada, yeah. province by province? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay? There are and some- by the way, the transfer payments that Alberta has been supporting the rest of Canada forever, there's not a lot of people out there that are that fond of that anymore, okay? Would it take a lot for the, a movement in Alberta to embrace a Bitcoin? Now, it only has to be Alberta. And it could be just, you know, the gas companies out there. Look, it's, it's open market, free market capitalism still. I mean, maybe it's not, but we still have a vestige of what everybody hopes returns to the creative destruction model of capitalism. Not manipulated, not Wall Street cronyism, all this stuff. And I'll tell you that the amount of uh, education that's taking place in the U.S. is very encouraging in my, in my uh, opinion, okay? So whether it's people sitting on a, a you know a, a Monday night uh, podcast amongst their own group the same thing's happening in Washington the same thing is happening in Canada so 45 members of parliament represented one third one third of this political party's members of parliament that's a good lo- level of interest and I promise you it's going to increase and they were praising Bitcoin miners from the Alberta spot they brought up Jamie Leverton okay so Jamie's been a guest on your show I haven't talked to her since that uh, thing, but they want her as a guest for their next uh, Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, do you know Do you know Steve Barber? I know Steve. Yeah. You know Steve. Okay, I was going to say, I was actually listening to him on, on yeah. Marty Bent's podcast okay. on my drive in here yeah. today. Yeah. I have a call with Marty Bent this afternoon. Oh, so, right yeah, on. It's, it's, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of, you know, things are moving. Um, that, Steve that, Barber's... It, that's encouraging that what you're saying. Like, I like that you're saying I'm wrong, uh, I, I and things are maybe moving faster than I even think. I want them to. Mm-hmm. Like I think for my own children, I want them okay. to. I just, we don't have that much time to, I know. to make this work. So, uh, this so is what is why. your time? So when you say that, and then I have some questions mm-hmm. for Jesse. What what what's your time frame? Like when you say we don't have enough time, that's because the way you're thinking of the credit markets and contagion and correct. The, I mean, look, you never know. There's an expression: risk happens fast. And right now, it's my gut feeling that everybody's almost whistling past the graveyard, okay? All you have to do is look at what happened in China with the Evergrande situation and how China CDS, credit default swap spreads on China now indicate that China, the second largest country in the nation, trades as a triple B credit. Triple B is one credit level above junk. China is gonna be a junk bond borrower. Second largest economy in the world is gonna be junk bond rated, okay? And... They have huge debt problems, and they just ban Bitcoin. The United States will look and say, 
Uh, by the way, I was down in Bretton Woods. Mm. I was invited down. Jeff and I actually drove. Jeff Booth and I drove from Montreal down to Bretton Woods. So the four hours I spent in the car each way with uh, Jeff Booth, that was worth a PhD. So I'm putting a PhD behind my name now because I spent eight <laughs> hours. Eight, eight hours. Every in time the, I speak with him, I feel like I yeah. learned something brand yeah, he's, new. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's awesome. But anyway, joke, joker, joking aside, no, he is. And we, uh, but in Bretton Woods, we both were uh, speaking on panels, separate panels, but we had the chance to listen to two days of discussion from some very large macro thinkers down in, in the U.S. So uh, uh, Tapiero, uh, uh, Professor, Professor Plum, I'm forgetting what his oh, name Mike, is. Mike Green. Mike Green hates Bitcoin. That's fine. You bring, you got to listen to I other people. I got into a bit of a Twitter exchange with Mike That's good. Green. Look, look, he's, and by the way, the man is a monster, okay? He looks like an offensive tackle, okay? So he could squish us like a bug, but he's a gentleman. Um, all of these people think the U.S. will be at war with China within five years. Now, this is pretty scary from a guy from Canada, all right? I don't want a world war. I actually think Bitcoin could stop world wars. And if China just handed the West this beautiful gift on a platter, it's Canada's job to take this and run with it. Well, well, that's the the working you know thesis of that Jason Lowry space yeah, boy, yeah. right? That. So I, I, and by I, the way, I, I was in. Well, I was in Boston. I have had biz, I've had dinner with Jason Lowry Jason. And, P, and Peter McCormick in Boston. The kid is off the charts brilliant. Off the charts brilliant. Yeah, because okay? he burst. So for people who don't know, I guess he burst into the the Bitcoin world, you know, three months ago. He's an MIT grad working at, you know, Space Force, yeah. who is trying to develop a thesis for why Bitcoin is, you know, we, we know- mutually, It's peaceful. Yeah. We, know, we know mutually assured destruction, right? He's trying to develop a thesis around the concept of, if you want to call it that, mutually assured, uh, assured preservation, where it's like, it, it inf it's a tool for enforcing peace, in a sense. And I, I can't go into explaining it because he's, you know, a rocket scientist. He is a rocket basically. scientist. Like literally. But he's, 20, so I, I'm not he's even 24 years old. I'm not even going to try to explain it, can, but yeah. Can I say yeah, yeah. one thing though that he, he and I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but one of the stories he told me and he said, China, this isn't the first time China has, uh, and he tweeted this out. He says, this is what China uses as a pistol. And it's a, it's a gun that's nozzle is pointed back in the <laughs> face. Okay. And he says, and they, and they, and they, they got an itchy trigger finger. So what happened in the 1500s? Uh, China had the best merchant fleet in the world for sailing around to various ports of call. And what it caused was uh, an emerging class of uh, citizens who were becoming quite powerful and rich. And it was all because they had the best navigational charts in the world, okay? Being able to follow the stars and get to the, reliably to these other ports. And the elites, they weren't communists at this time, but the elites in China viewed this emerging class as a threat and they burned all the navigational charts and China lost their dominance of the seas and along came the British. Okay, fast forward to today. Is this sort of like, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme? I don't know. And so, so is, uh, what, what's the gentleman's name again? Lowry? Jason Lowry. Okay, so is his idea that this is peaceful? And, I, and my thinking is when you have a fiat-based currency that is, you know, the global monetary reserve asset, to protect that in our petrodollar system, you actually need a, need a military to protect the power of that. If we move to something like Bitcoin being the reserve, where the property rights are secured by cryptography, uh -huh. that essentially is acting as the military, protecting everybody's property rights, and we don't need a military to, in the real world, world no, a physical- there will still be a military. Is, is my thinking of no, this- there, there will still be a military, but the war will be fought in essentially cyberspace. And Jason is writing his thesis for the U.S. Space Force, um, and uh, he is um, uh, writing the thesis on the basis that Bitcoin can deter, okay? It, 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 it is a, a deterrent for nuclear mutually assured destruction. And uh, I like the thesis, but I'm more impressed with the young man. Now, there were a bunch of uh, Bitcoin, uh, what do we call them, maxis that, that are, are certain he's a PSYOP, okay? And uh, <laughs> well, they are. They, they and, are and, but it's fair to be skeptical, okay, right? Look, I mean, he, they're allowed to be. I'll yep. just tell you, I met the man in real life. If he's a PSYOP, then my God, the U.S. is pretty darn good at uh, I, I have more at, questions at for do. these guys, but uh, Greg, I, ha yeah. I have to ask, your time frame, when you say, you know, the time is of the essence here, what, how do you envision the next few years playing out? Like, what do you see 
In your life, what do you see that in the next two to three years, and what do you see in 10 years? Well, Jeff Booth, I'll borrow this from him, 10 years of, there will be 100 years of change in the next 10 years, okay? Very simply. So I talked about the Fosmobile 100 years ago, 120 years ago. We will see the equivalent of that 100 years of change in the next 10 years, okay? I'm told we're already working on things like uh, uh, taxis, uh, airborne taxis and, you know, flying around cities and Jetsons. I mean, a lot of the things you see on the Jetsons actually are all coming. This, all the stuff from the 60s they envisioned okay, when so, we actually okay, had so hard they, money. They, well, they, and <laughs> now, now we can people, get back to dreaming well, about that stuff again. Plenty of people actually predicted the internet, right? And, and you know, being able to transfer money on the internet and uh, whatnot. So here, here's what I envisage. Envision. I'm going to pull out my trader uh, hat and I'm going to say, I'm not going to give you, I'm going to give you a target, but not a time frame, or I'll give you a trend, but not a target. Okay. In the next three years, absolutely. Bitcoin goes so much higher. Why? We have seen countries leapfrog hedge funds. Can you tell me a year ago, we would have thought that El Salvador would be doing what they want. And incidentally, the final thing I want to talk about before these, after these guys talking, I want to talk about Jose Limas and the CEO of Ibex Mercado. In El Salvador, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about them. Okay. Uh, but uh, at the okay, where do I see happening? I I will tell you, over the next ten years, I can't even begin to predict in increments of one year where we're going to be. But the fact that countries are leapfrogging hedge funds to invest in Bitcoin, uh, it just means that the race has just gone to the to the next level. Okay, the acceleration of adoption. There are six million people in El Salvador. One and a half million of them had bank accounts. Right now, there's 4 million El Salvadorans that have a Bitcoin wallet. Tell me this isn't life-changing. And, so and just, they're already sending millions of dollars back and forth from the States and to I'm Salvador. Correct. And I'm in touch. I'm in touch. No okay, cost. so yeah. I'm in touch with the merchant solution guy on the ground in El Salvador, and I'm privy to some pretty impressive numbers, okay? Of a dog. But, but let me go back to this. What happens? I don't know how long it's going to take, I will just tell you, it tends to happen a lot quicker than you think it will. In both ways, people will stop rolling over debt at an auction. And what happens when you stop rolling debt at an auction? Everyone else who's out there says, good Lord, I just had this thing that I thought I would be able to mature at some point in time. And now an auction failed. I don't want to even sit around and hold this until it matures. I'm going to start selling. And it just starts snowballing. It doesn't have to happen at the U.S. Treasury. But you see it happen all the time. Argentina has defaulted four times in my life already. Argentina is a G20 country. Turkey is a G20 country. Guys, these guys are... It's just so foreign for Canadians, you know, as someone in Canada or the U.S. to think about that. I'm I'm agreeing with you. I just feel like it's so foreign. Then you better take the glue bag off your head, okay? <laughs> because at the end of the day, we are not we are not the uh, the the reality out there. Yeah, we we've, we've we had, are the privilege. We've okay? had a cushy ride, correct, for a very long time. Correct, mm-hmm. Co- correct. Okay, I want to come back to what yeah. you were just uh, yeah. m- mentioning here. Uh, here's the questions that I'm getting, and Mike, I don't know if you're getting the same thing, Jesse. I'm interested into your take onto this. Uh, people are asking me. Do I hold multiple hardware wallets? Like if I have some Bitcoin, am I holding multiple hardware wallets? Do I do multi-sig? And the other thing that I'm getting asked a lot is that if it becomes an asset that I can earn interest against and I have to give up my Bitcoin to a lending institution, am I going to be doxxed in some capacity? And is there, do you envision a world where there's more peer-to-peer lending and I can lend some Bitcoin and earn interest on it? So from a security point, do I use multiple hardware wallets? Do I do multi-sig stuff? And then on the lending front. Right. I mean, that, there's a lot to that question. Just I guess. have at um, it. In terms of wallets and what's right and what's wrong, there's no right answer, really. It's all B- Bitcoin security is layers, right? It's okay. Maybe you have a hot wallet like a, or a lightning wallet for, you know, okay, I'm going to be buying my coffees or buying little things and trading with people online or contracting, you know, for things online. So that uh, would be something like on my phone, putting like a blue uh, wallet. Yeah, putting like, okay, I have a hundred or 200 bucks in there. And then there's, you know, you have your shake pays of the world and your other uh, still blue wallet, moon wallet, whatever. Okay, maybe you keep a thousand or 2000 bucks on there. But then when you get into, you know, much bigger numbers, okay, you're gonna wanna go into hardware wallets. And then maybe, dep- again, depending on how much, how much it is to you, like how much do you value that money that you have, that Bitcoin that you have? Do you need just a single sig? Bitcoin single signature, I'll say the full term, uh, Bitcoin wallet, do you want to create your own multi-signature scheme, which 
if you're not technically savvy, is going to be tricky, or you can engage with, you know, a CASA or an Unchained cap um, to help to have them help you set it up, which is, you know, it's a perfectly good service, but they all have trade-offs, right? Okay, if you do a two of three setup with someone like CASA, you are, you are effectively letting them know how much Bitcoin you have. They do, they do not have control of it, to be clear, but they will have one of your three keys if you do a two of three setup. And maybe you keep one and you can have one on your, you, know, you can have one on a cold card, one on your phone in the event that, you know, you're traveling or something, you don't, you know, you want to destroy one, you can destroy one very easily. Um, so no one can access it until you get back in touch with Casa. You can set up all kinds of rules around it. Um, so I had there, a little, it's layers. I had, okay. There's like lots so, of options so to go I, and it gets trickier and there's trade-offs at, at every step. But, but I guess you can have... If you make it and graduate to the point of having a hardware wallet, yeah. where you're taking your Bitcoin, your keys off an exchange, yeah. you can choose to separate it into two hardware wallets if that makes you feel better and divide your Bitcoin holdings across hardware wallets. Of course, wallets. yeah. You can and have it's still multiple, all yours and you can have multiple hardware wallets. You can have multiple devices and each device, when you, when you think of a device, every device has its own key, right? Has, or has its own pri uh, private key. So you can have multi dev multiple devices, each with their own key and every device meaning every key can have, you know, one coin or whatever amount of coins, however you're splitting it up into each device, or you can set it up so that you have multiple devices, but you need to use those multiple devices to sign for the one bigger pot. So for Rockstar members, because we've been getting this so much from, I would say people who are over 45, 50, um, we're actually gonna do a little session where we just show them step by step because so many people, really need it kind of mapped out. Jesse, maybe it's, this would be a great okay. thing for you. And we'll like just this, add something, okay? All these people probably have a trading account at TD or yep, wherever. Yep. Okay, look, don't overlook the simplicity of just buying a Bitcoin ETF as also an avenue so to get exposure Bitcoin, to it. So the Canadian Bitcoin ETF. The purpose, I know you're gonna say not your keys, not your no, coins. No, 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 okay. I'll, tell, I'll, I'll speak. I will there. just tell you that it's as simple as buying Royal Bank of Canada stock, okay? Don't overthink it. Get yourself three percent there, and then learn and then the beauty of the stuff. technology yeah, and storing it. it in your own. So if you're safe just starting out, like you're you're fine with telling people get the Bitcoin ETF. Just get yourself allocated to some now. Okay, look, for the last four months, they were trying to f figure out how to get their keys and download a wallet and do KYC and a AML and all this, and the price has gone up forty percent since the beginning of the. Oh, sorry, Bitcoin's up forty percent in the month of October. Okay, just get your exposure. The world isn't ending tomorrow. I promise you that. It might end somewhere after tomorrow, but tomorrow <laughs> it isn't ending, okay? Get it today. Go onto, the, onto your TD Greenline app and buy btcc.u. Purpose, large, trades right on net asset value. You can put it in your RRSPs so and your TFSAs. And by the way, when you do that, the government is funding 50% of your purchase. So that's what I was going to say, that when I talk to people about it, I usually recommend if you're going to buy the ETF, do it in your registered accounts. Like get those gains in the most tax sheltered vehicle you can. So your RSP or TFSA, that's right. my preferred way to do it. But then if you're going to, if you want to buy non-registered, unless, you know, you think, okay, you're going to cash out back to CAD to buy the actual thing that's because fair, go through the but, experience okay, of- Okay, look, I my father, my father who died with way more money than I ever had, and many people, hopefully your mom and dads are still around. They are the people that need to do it today. And my dad never had yeah, fair. an iPhone. My dad never had a credit card. Here's another stupid Foss story. My dad never had a credit card. I graduate from Cornell. I come to work for Royal Bank of Canada. I'm like, dad, you need one of these beautiful credit cards. This, have I told you the story? No. This gold card. You got to get oh my this God. gold Remember card. when the gold okay. cards came so out? You gotta be yeah. a, he's never had a mortgage in his life. He'd never had a credit card. He's like, okay, listen, kid, I'm going to get this credit card just to make you happy. All right. Then about a month and a half later, he goes, I don't understand how these credit cards work. I go, well, what are you talking about? He goes, I already have a bill for $4,990. <laughs> and I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, it says I went to a, re a stereo shop and I bought $4,900 worth of stereo equipment. His card had been stolen in the mail <laughs> before he even got it, okay? Thanks, he gets, Greg. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. He Thanks, calls son. me up. He, he goes, you're such an idiot, okay? <laughs> yeah, I told you I didn't want one of these cards, okay? You think he is gonna do keys and, and stuff with Bitcoin? Uh-uh, uh-uh. Did he trade stocks his whole life? 
Yes. Okay, Dad. <laughs> buy some Bitcoin. Buy it like you're buying. Our seventy-four-year-old mother has yes. a ShakePay account. I will just have you know. You guys are Croatian. 74. Listen to you. You're Croatian. <laughs> My dad, okay, couldn't find Croatia on a map. Okay, so you're, you've lived different lives. My father. Okay. Go here's ahead, a, here's a consideration for you though, right? When congrats you know, on getting him the gold card, by the way, Greg. Congrats well, that, on that did a lot. Right? That did a lot for me. When, when you know, eventually, if your older mother or father they pass away. Their estate, everything has to be sold, right? Or it's deemed disposition on the day of death, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, in Canada, is, yeah. that's how it works, right? Mm-hmm. So that is now, what, whatever they own yeah. is known. It's, it's privy okay. to the governments. They're gonna wanna mm-hmm. tax it. Okay, take their, take, you know, we're selling it this day. Mm-hmm. You're taking their capital gains. Mm-hmm. If it's in physical, physical if it's an if it's we are not Bitcoin, advocating we are not advocating i'm not talking we are not advocating dodging tax i'm not laws. talking about dodging tax okay. i'm saying it just so happens it's sitting in bitcoin form okay let's jesse let's not greg's overthink on the phone this. with yeah. government let's not overthink this. Okay. Okay. You guys are having two different by the way well here's the thing look canada's in bad shape adopting bitcoin and actually taxing capital gains on bitcoin could skate canada nicely on site and by the way i always told my dad Paying capital gains is not a bad thing. It actually means you made some money, knucklehead. Okay? So don't try and like be so fancy that you don't want to pay taxes and you don't make any money. Like that's overthinking I'm stuff. not saying pay taxes. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, here, I'm yes. saying reduce Look, taxes to the best all, of your we, ability. As we a- all agree on various things. Yeah. If you own zero Bitcoin, that's mm. the big problem. That's the wrong, that's number, the that's the wrong number to own, 100%. You know, it, was, it was talking to Jeff Booth this past Saturday that made me realize that now, so now I've held Bitcoin for a year and a half, a uh, year, since March, uh, March, April, 2020. And um, the price has gone up so much that things around me are getting cheaper. And I've never really thought of like, wow, like this is my savings, but the world around me is getting less expensive because my savings is going up in value. And it, it was a simple thing he said that made me realize that. And that is such a beautiful feeling that like yeah. my life's energy yeah. stored in Bitcoin Perfect. is going up in value. And when I look around at the cars around the street and every the price of houses, even in Canada, although prices of houses, we're a real estate brokerage, we know what the prices of houses have done. The price of everything in Bitcoin is going down. So my my we- my personal kind of wealth or however yeah. you want to say it is increasing because my standard has become a savings mechanism that is going up in value. Y- your personal unit of account is now Bitcoin, right? You don't measure your life in dollars anymore. You measure your life in Bitcoin. You've made the mental change yeah. of my unit of account is Bitcoin. I think in Bitcoin. So when I look around, I see assets, I see whatever, I see prices of things, I'm seeing it as going down. And that's, that's a big and great mental leap to make. Except that we represent like 0.1% yeah, of all it's a time Yeah, so that's why I mean, so I'm curious yeah, with Mike, yeah. when, when Mike, when people are coming on your call on Monday nights there, that I don't even think you can broach that topic. Like, I don't think you can enter the conversation with someone who doesn't know anything about Bitcoin with, I mean, your savings are going to go up in value. Or can you? What have you been, what kind of conversations have you been having? I, for the most part, I mean, we got into, you know, what is money? Because if to understand Bitcoin, you have to have some general concept of what money is, which most people have no idea. So when people come to me or message me privately and say, well, you know, I'm kind of curious about Bitcoin. I don't really understand. It's like, well, can you explain the current system? And the answer inevitably is no, because <laughs> no one can explain how <laughs> what they're in right now. So, um, yeah, so uh, it, anytime it gets back to, uh, you know, what kind of conversation is, is around that, people generally understand what inflation is. So if they can wrap their head around assets are inflating, but the price of goods are inflating, and the CPI index is not an accurate representation of what's actually that's going a straight on out, out lie. there. Right? Yeah. At this point, that's a straight out lie. And so, and so sometimes people have to be made aware of that, right? Because it's like, hey, you guys, look, like, look they're, they're saying that it's two or 3% or it may sneak up to four, but what's the what's the price of lumber done? What's oil? What's food? What's what, the price of a ribeye? Exactly. That's what are key. all these things? That's really key. It, it's, it's huge. Mm-hmm. And so and so then people are like, oh yeah, no, that's fifteen percent. That's twenty percent. So what's the real rate of inflation? And so the way I explain it is, look, if the real rate of inflation is fifteen percent, let's say conservatively, if you don't have assets that are hurtling that inflation rate, you're drowning, yeah, and you don't even realize it. And so people are like, oh, well, that makes sense. So what you know, thinking about the the cost of goods, you know, decreasing in price is a bit of a brain 
you know, fry for At most first, people. But right? once you make the leap, it, it, it I mean, we're there, yeah, but I, it's I was not, nine steps ahead. So yeah, talking yeah, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, t- I mean, that's, no, a, but that's important too. Yeah. to be on a Bitcoin standard, to, to think in terms of Bitcoin is very challenging. People aren't there yet. Right. They, if they can wrap their head around what's going on and, and the major problems with the existing system and the dollar and what's happening. And if they're in cash, that they're that they are they realize that they are drowning because they don't have assets that are hurdling the inflation rate now it's like oh shit i might be in trouble this is awesome to me because you're helping people at a different level than greg is helping people and that jesse's helping people this is like i'm this is amazing what's happening in canada right now something you must get that i get all the time is that tom i've heard you talk about bitcoin I'm still going to buy gold. You told me about gold for 10 years, Tom. <laughs> told me about gold. So I'm going to buy gold because I can put it in my hand. And I always come back with, what are the characteristics of gold that made gold what it was? It wasn't that you could put it in your hand. It was that it's, it's to me, it's saleability across space, time, and scales. And if we define gold around its characteristics around those three things, had nothing to do with the fact that you could put it in your hand. It was with the characteristics that gold had. Right. And that's what I try to do to get people off thinking that's about yep. gold instead of the whole, because I'm sure you guys get this all the time. I can put gold in my hand. E- and, e- and I really want, like, I'm an ex-gold, I wear a gold chain sure. because of my family went through hyperinflation in the 90s in Yugoslavia. So for me, I get gold, but Bitcoin is not even i can't even say it's gold 2.0 it's so much beyond with bitcoin we're not even talking about bitcoin the network yeah we're not even yeah, talking yeah. about that it's so different so so that's cool that you're you're doing that stuff but i can imagine the challenges that you have as well well you know it the there i mean there's so much great info out there and i've and i've pulled so much stuff from bitcoin twitter and come up with graphs and and you know pulled illustrations stuff that just makes it easy for people to learn so I've gone through, you know, slide presentations and I've used uh, Anil said so. Uh, oh, I've my God, a, his content's amazing. I mean, I've used a ton of his stuff because the visuals are so striking and it just really helps people wrap their head around it. But so when it comes to conversations like that, where people, you, you know, you have a you sort of have that conversation about money and, you know, what would you know, for the past however many years, what would have been the ultimate asset? Most people would say gold. And that's not because of what, exactly what you said, but it's because people decided that that was going to be the most valuable asset that they could have. So then it's like, okay, well, let's explain, you know, let's get into why that was value or why that is valuable. Right. And so when you start to do the comparisons and you pull up this chart of fiat, gold and Bitcoin, and you look at, you know, uh, divisibility, portability, programmability, um, you know, all these different characteristics, and you see that Bitcoin is superior to gold in every department with the exception of, you know, a historical run, then you're like, okay, wow, now people can see that chart and they're like, that makes a lot of sense. So even though I can't put it in my hand, you know, this is still superior. So a lot, I mean, I went on a coffee date last night with this girl. She's like, well, I can't, like, where is it? Like, you know, and so. <laughs> I, the, he said, said right, look so, at those stars over right? there. there. Exactly. Is, right? So I'm like, if you can, if you can appreciate the value of gold, just realize that this is superior in every department. So I forget if I ever mentioned this analogy, and I'm pretty sure I heard it from Michael Saylor uh, about the maps. Did we talk about yes. this on one of the podcasts? Yeah, yeah. I'll, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do a real yeah. quick reminder. <clears throat> I'll do a real quick reminder of it. So Saylor talked about how he had an opportunity to buy uh, like Rand McNally physical maps, right? You can look at the map, you hold it in your hand, you can fold it up and put it in your back pocket, drive around the car, look at the roads, whatever. It's a physical map it but it has its limitations it's great or he could buy google maps or you know he was contemplating buying google or apple or whichever one it was doesn't really matter but that's a digital map you can't hold that map but it has all these extra characteristics you can zoom in you can zoom out you check the streets you check the traffic flow you check the local restaurants what time they're open what their ratings are you can't do that on a paper (laughs) map but with a digital programmable map you have all kinds of opportunities and features that can be baked into it that you can't be bake into physical money. It's interesting. And Greg, I want to get to your point one second. Just give me one, <coughs> sure. one, one thing I want to share is that Mark Cuban recently has been going off on some Bitcoin stuff. And what's fascinating to me is that Bitcoin can evolve faster than the critics can corner it. For example, his biggest argument right now is that people will never spend Bitcoin because you're going to be taxed. So you'll never spend it, even though I've been tipping people all around, you know, even though we, that's just a fallacy to begin with. But 
Jack Maulers retweeted something to him, I think last night, that said, I'm, send, I'm using the Bitcoin network to not spend Bitcoin, to send US dollars from one place yeah. to another, or US dollars, it's a US payment, dollar, rail. It's a a payment, payment rail. rail. Yeah. So the moment that a critic of this tries to corner Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoin evolves into something else and you can't really stop it. So that's why, Greg, to your point, I think it's evolving faster. And then also, Jesse, to your point, when it's a digital thing, there's properties that are going to come from this that none of us can even imagine right. just yet. But so, so let's go back, though, to, to the gold. I find that, and first of all, great conversation because, you know, you have to get people understanding that uh, inflation is real. Most people in the world, this is a fact, most people in the world are in the lower, less privileged and thus lower uh, uh, price bucket. Um, they keep maybe $10,000 in a savings account. That is their life savings in cash, in fiat, sitting in a bank. That's the reality. We're, they're the less privileged, they're hardworking, no question, but that is the world, okay? Um, these are the people that get hurt the most. When you print more yeah. money, these are the people that get hurt. But let's go back to the gold. What was gold? It was scarce. Uh, it, it was, it was accepted as a universal, uh, store of value and, and, uh, you know, it, perhaps it's not, it's certainly transferable, but it's not as transferable as Bitcoin. It's divisible, but not as divisible as Bitcoin. It's verifiable, but not as verifiable as Bitcoin. So here's the reality. Dang, if you're that far down the road and you understand what gold is, going to Bitcoin is a very simple logical for everyone in the world except the gold bugs that don't want to lose the title but if you've done all the work in austrian economics and you understand why fiat's always fail gold is only 10 trillion dollars there's 890 trillion other financial assets out there besides gold that is the, what is going to be coming over to bitcoin too okay bonds are 400 or debt global debt is 400 trillion dollars and it's the biggest piece of garbage i've ever seen in 30 years of trading okay anyone who owns any bonds as an investment failed grade 11 math you've heard me say that very those are what we should be focusing on if you get the gold i own gold i own silver i own real estate i own hard assets now, some Bitcoin maxis will come after me. Oh, you don't have conviction? I'm like, no, but I've done this my whole, I absolutely have conviction, but I'll be just fine if Bitcoin goes to my price target because my X percent in Bitcoin going up a hundredfold from here makes that a pretty juicy asset in the future, okay? Is and your math still uh, accurate when I share with people? I always share with people that, like I like Greg Foth's example, that debt to GDP is four to one. Yeah. If the debt goes up 3% just on interest payments yeah. on that, that the GDP has to increase exactly. by 12% to exactly. keep that delta. That's still your thinking? But it's, it's not just mine. It's other people are actually going out there with that math. And it's not hard, right? That organic growth of the debt balloon globally is a coupon, because that's what a, a fiat contract or a bond is, a coupon. You have to pay this coupon. And if the numerator is growing at 3%, but the size of the numerator is four times the denominator, which is your tax base, the numerator is growing at 12%. Is the global GDP growing at 12%? Uh -huh, I don't think so. So explain to people how they could get it to grow at 12%. Because if they, well, we can mint so the, the coin, right? We can always mint the no, platinum stop trillion that. dollar that's coin. Not, that is, that's a, okay, here's my response to that. That's double that, entry accounting. That, that well, was a joke. That some was people a joke. are serious about it, including but, but that idiot Joe to... Weisenthal, okay? He is getting more and more off track in his arguments. Why is he talking about the coin again? He's oh, no, talk, he always he's... talks about the coin, but today he says, uh, debasement's a fallacy. You're using the wrong word. Mm -hmm. Like he's just, he's becoming, uh, but, but, that, but that's he's how always they, been okay, like let's this. Time is, out, this time is out. I want to get back MO. to this. I want to get back to this. All right, look, global debt is growing at, a, 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 at graciously, I'm saying 12% or 12 times faster, excuse me, is growing at 12%. If GDP were to grow at 12%, how do you get GDP to grow at 12%? Consistently, forever. You need to understand, this isn't just for the next quarter or I, half. I have, the, forever. I, have the, I have the answer. How? Inflation. M2, okay. put more dollars in the system. So, so then what happens then to, yes, you can measure it. First of all, what happens to your bond investment? You're an absolute fool. What happens to anything <laughs> that's not a hard asset? It gets, I'm not gonna use it debased, Joe. Oh, actually, in honor of Joe Weisenthal, it gets debased, okay? I don't care if you wanna call it, uh, you know, debased, he calls it, oh, it's impurities, bringing in, that's his commentary today. It was debased like the fiat, the Roman coin got debased because they start, stopped putting less and less gold in it 
per yeah, they're clipping. Per, they're okay, they're clipping. Or, okay, yeah. so look, look. At the end of the day, though, semantics aside, it's very simple math that the global GDP will never grow fast enough to keep up with the coupon. Now, because why? What happens when you get inflation? You have to readjust in the numerator what the, what the coupon is because no one's going to lend you for an extended period of time on a real basis negative interest rates. Why would you be in an investment that guarantees you to lose money in real terms? So if you try to go to grow the GDP at 12% through inflation by pushing more money the into coupons the system, in the, the, coupon- the coupon in the numerator goes up in lockstep. It's impossible, guys. It's a debt spiral. Why is this? This is physics. This is pure physics. I think we're just agreeing with you, but it's so awe-inspiring. I'm not joking. It is so awe-inspiring to think that we are at this point that you, as humans, I think it's difficult to extrapolate forward when you see that this can't continue. Most people don't even have a clue that we're in this spot. And they don't teach you this in school because if they did, you would realize that the whole banking system is built on the necessity of capital, excuse me, of collateral appreciation. Okay, Greg, I have one for you. Everybody said the world was going to come to end in 2008, you know, and it didn't come to the end. Everything's kept going. So okay, it's just going to keep on, going. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So it, you know how close we were to coming to the end, right? You have I, no clue. Yeah, no, you've told I sat you've in told, that chair. I told, sat in that yeah. chair. People But take, I think I think somebody for just from the outside who okay. has not sat in the chair, okay. they're thinking, okay, guys, I like the story. I like and everything is, you guys and, are sharing, but you know what? In 2008, everybody said we were that close and it didn't happen. So, you know what? We got at least another 10 my 20 respons- years. I re- my yep. response to that, you're too stupid. I'm not going to spend any time <laughs> on trying to protect you from your own stupidity, okay? <laughs> stupidity is a crime, okay? And you are fucking stupid, okay? So, so all we can do is teach the people that want to learn, not the people that are that stupid. Okay. okay. And yeah, the, the crowd will come when they have no choice. Yeah. When it's just when that's just the way it is now. Look, we no. need to help the people that don't understand it. And then if they resist it, this we've is done a, everything we could yeah. and you're going to, you know, it's evolution will take its natural course, okay? Uh, you know, wh- who's that guy that, uh, you know, it's 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 like the herd. They'll, we'll call the herd and you'll be the first one to be called, okay? Because that's w- what happens. Jesus. No, it's um, but no, I, no, I, I, I'm, I'm look, agreeing I'm, with, I'm agreeing I'm, with I'm everything positive. you're saying. I want to be hopeful. Yeah. Bitcoin offers our children the chance to escape the absolute greed and selfishness of our generation. You know what's fascinating? My 15 year old daughter and 19 year old son, they get it completely get it like they understand this okay. this isn't even difficult yeah and i don't know if it's because their father is running around just repeating all this stuff at not, i mean that probably helps a yeah little maybe bit. Mm-hmm. but they just it's it is like a natural thing to them they my daughter when she has some money now she's like well dad i want to get this into the bank so you can send it over to buy me some more bitcoin for my i love savings. it that's great so you could just see how they're just adopting this yeah. kind of thing hold on we're not letting you go no, yet. I'm not you wanted running. to share you wanted to share a story of somebody who are you saying? jose yeah. Okay, but yeah. let's talk. You, I, I've taken the mic. Let's talk more about these yeah, guys. Yeah. Like, well, uh, we're like, all used to it, Greg. We like hearing from you. This is this is. We kinda, just came to watch. This I don't is know. your show, Greg. I don't, we're on yeah, your yeah, show. Yeah, we're on your show. We just came. It's, it's the Foss Pod. We rebranded right? the podcast. Right? It's the Foss Show. Yeah. Hey. Okay. I am very grateful be. to you guys as offered me the very first platform, and that's the truth, right? I'm I'm my daughter is actually really excited for my Twitter followers. She's actually, my God, dad, I had no idea. You were almost as popular as <laughs> Greg, it, someone, you someone. Should, you, you should know, know, know I mean? that's a two way cool street points. too, because we were over here sitting uh, in Oakville, scratching our head going, you know, it looks like everybody should figure this stuff out, but someone to sit down with your experience and come in and share to our audience, right. and our members, you bring a different perspective that we can't share. Mm-hmm. So it's totally a two way street. Well, I appreciate we, that. And my daughter, by the way, uh, who is exactly like your, your kids. Okay. Like, and my sons and the, you know, they, they love Bitcoin. Why? They've grown up with an iPhone. It's not foreign to them to nope. do everything on their phone and natural for them to store mm-hmm. stuff on their iPhone. Okay, I have one for you. We're a real estate brokerage. We work with people to buy rental properties. They can put 20% down with leverage. They can control the whole property. You do your numbers right. It's a pretty good deal. Mm-hmm. I feel the real estate market has taken on a monetization component where a lot of people who don't understand Bitcoin, you know, throw their money into real estate and real estate prices have kind of gone up in this country. Mm -hmm. We have a lack of supply. We have a crazy amount of population growth, specifically in Ontario, right here in the GTA. We do. What happens to the monetization aspect that real estate has absorbed over the next 10 years as Bitcoin maybe gets a a larger following? Does a lot of that kind of strip out over to Bitcoin, do you feel? It's an asset. Um, I uh, personally, you know, I own uh, four properties. 
including the house I live in, all right? So three other properties outside the house I live in. Obviously, I think real estate is a good store of value. Is it portable? If the world goes absolutely cataclysmic and into the Bitcoin maxi, uh, we need these citadels and all this. No, I'm not putting my property in my back pocket, but I'm still, I have a vestige of hope that there's enough smart people in this world that will stop the insanity and control a checking account and a savings account, very simply, okay? Fiat needs an off-ramp. The politicians understand this. The sooner we embrace it and the first mover in the country space will reap more uh, uh, more uh, rewards. It, now, th I think that's inevitable. Now, what do you think, Greg, what do you think is um, a catalyst to that? Like we were talking earlier about, you know, countries uh, debt being out of control. And at some point, maybe they're like, hey, we don't want to trade, let's say, energy in you know, fiat, uh, any, they, any, you know, any fiat, US dollars, yeah. and it's like, now we want to trade, we want to trade in, in Bitcoin. Is that sort of like the tipping I point? I think energy which, is always, energy is always uh, an, a, an increase in the efficiency of your energy uses, which includes Bitcoin mining, by the way, has always accompanied an increase in productivity and quality and of life point. for civilization okay and it makes sense it's only the first law of thermodynamics okay conservation of energy therefore bitcoin bitcoin bringing the ability to monetize and here's so one of the guys that was on the pod uh, excuse me on the presentation i did to the mps is uh the M member of parliament for the area huron bruce okay so you can figure out who this party is very simply uh he's a great gentleman who has canada's largest nuclear reactor in his backyard okay that's the bruce power yeah. do you know there's times during the day where canada pays americans to take our power pays them not do we Wait, get a really ontario? low we do that out of ontario out of the bruce out of well, the bruce on. nuclear i swear to god i, thought, I knew quebec was doing that okay. we're doing that out of ontario paying them okay so don't Wait, you think don't, someone don't forget that we have politicians running this stuff right? okay like, but here's the thing they don't here's know how thing. to conduct business. well no they need yeah. to get off their base load power because if not that you don't power up and power down a nuclear yeah. core reactor, uh, according to the, the <laughs> yeah. number of There's toasters. No big and, on okay, yeah. so would it make sense though? Think, 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 Foss. Would it make sense if that nuclear reactor was mining Bitcoin rather than paying Americans to take the power? I mean, as a pure economist, and a small business manager, don't you think that makes sense? We are paying, paying. Americans out of Ontario. Correct, paying. I knew Quebec was. I figured Alberta with its energy, but out of Ontario. Alberta's not, but uh, Quebec has the same thing. When these turbines are turning in James Bay, right, th you need to get this power somewhere or it'll fry your grid. People do not understand how the economics did, of did an I electricity Did I hear Adam grid. Beck properly? Beck? Is Adam Beck? Back. Back. back, back. Yeah. Did I hear Adam Beck properly when he said there's more unused energy? The amount of unused energy in Quebec could power the entire Bitcoin network? Did easily, I hear him say that? Easily. Do you know yeah. that Bitcoin only uses 1% of total global energy Why consent? is that fact not brought up to all these Because they, they don't want, they don't want yeah. to hear it. it. Come on, Tom, we're only 12 years old. I mean, tw yeah, we act like we're 12 years old. Bitcoin is only 12 <laughs> years old, okay? Also, and people view that power usage as wasteful, right? They haven't made the connection. Okay, that. Well, no. they don't understand how the no, grid works. Obviously and that's unfortunate. No, so we need to teach them physics. We also need view. to teach them mathematics. Uh, more than 50% of the energy that's produced globally is actually wasted, okay? Uh, if it means that you're flaring natural gas, if it means you're running a turbine, but there's nobody to take that power, if it means things as simple as a waterfall that's running and you're not tapping that resource, okay? Is it steam that you're venting off of a, you know, you're not using a combined cycle generator? There's so many Did ways. Did you see the report out of North Vancouver with that Canadian company? Yeah, that's that, garbage. That's a it, bullshit not, report. It doesn't matter. It, oh, yeah, it's true. It's 100 oh, homes. It's know, nothing but, but an ES. It's bullshit. Okay, I call yeah. them out. That is that is bullshit <laughs> ESG advertising. There you go, Tom. Okay, so yeah, you know, certified lesson. bullshit. Gotta, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not bullshit. It's just, it's marketing for their stock price. It's yeah, like, you know, it. I mean, this ESG it's, narrative itself and all the stuff that these people are doing for ESG compliance is actually very dangerous itself. And why do I say that? Because I'm a partner at Valid is power, and uh, we, you know, we have two gigawatts of power, 
two gigawatts. That's two thousand yeah, megawatts. Yeah. Okay. Got and it. So when you see an announcement like that, you're like, it's, it's no, it's dropping. just it's it's again, it's ESG. Uh, what was they, they, they call virtue, virtue marketing or virtue, virtue signaling. signaling? Virtue yeah. signaling. Okay. Yeah, like, it. thank you very much. I mean, it sounds so awesome. You guys are somewhat criminal. Mm -hmm. No, really, it's 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 pretty gross. So that being said, it happens all the time, especially in the Bitcoin mining sphere. So we're using 100% renewable resources to mine Bitcoin. Oh, is that right? The electrons, just because you're based in Sweden, the electrons are so smart they know exactly to go to your power uh, to your Bitcoin miners because it's geothermal. But the thing that you're using for fossil fuels, none of those electrons go to your your mining rigs. Well, it doesn't work that way, but still, we're using 100% geo, uh, renewable resources because it's geothermal. Maybe I'll just give a quick plug. Did you ever listen to the Harry Sudok interview on what Bitcoin did? I, I know Harry Sudok. I'm not sure if I listened to that okay. specific. Okay, well, for, for specific. anyone that wants to learn mm -hmm. a little bit more about power grids and how, oh, yeah. how that market works, he, oh, yeah. he had a great, oh. you know, it was, it was back in the summer sometime. It was but this is why July. Bitcoin, so just, but Bitcoin can actually stabilize the grid. So what do we have? We have off-the-grid power plants. Okay, in North Bay, Ontario, it's a peaker plant, meaning it was there to supply electricity to Southern Ontario when the eight days of the year, there was too much draw on the system because of air conditioning that the regular system couldn't handle it. So they fire up these peaker plants. Well, here's the neat thing. What do you do with those peaker plants the other 357 days of the year? Ah, maybe you mind Bitcoin. Don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. That simple. You're actually, you're, you're giving me hope that you, if you spoke to that many MPs and the message was received, I always envisioned this unfolding that the government would get so desperate that taxation would go through the roof. Uh, you can't tax conf anymore. Confiscation of property can, might okay, even. Okay, that, uh, that is true, but uh, that happens not in Canada, I hope. Mm -hmm. And if it does, your parents are going to be like, dang, we moved from yeah, yeah. wherever to escape <laughs> yeah. that. And now it's happening in yeah, Canada, yeah. right? Yeah, no, you're actually painting a more hopeful picture for me. But so, you have to. Bitcoin yeah. is hope, guys. Bitcoin solves so many problems, okay? It teaches people mathematics. It teaches people how to save. It teaches people not to consume. It teaches people that maybe buying this $80,000 car. To produce more than they consume. Fair to enough. To be productive. That's yeah. fair. But yeah. here's what I mean. How many people's first, in, in when you got out of university and you got your first job, what is the thing you aspired to? Did you aspire to a new stereo, to a new car? Most likely. Now, the smart kids are aspiring to get a little bit in Bitcoin. And you turn this consumption oriented, perhaps the economy as a consumption oriented economy is what's bad for the environment. All these things you buy and then throw out in the, in the junk heaps because it's, you know, it's purchase, uh, uh, you know, wears out over time. So, Mike, I'm going to come back to you, Greg, in a second. Mike, why are you doing what you're doing? Like Monday nights, you could be doing other stuff. What's, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, I, I have no background in finance. I didn't understand money. Um, I was always terrible with money. Um, I never had a lot of it. And uh, I just kind of always got by. And so as soon as, as soon as Bitcoin, the light bulb went off, as Greg just said, it teaches you to become a saver. It just changed my complete, like my whole outlook. And when I realized what, just by having made that move and getting into Bitcoin and sort of, you know, adopting a Bitcoin standard, realizing what it's, you know, just what it's done for me, I'm like, shit, I'm in such a good position now. I just want to pay it forward. I want to get as many people to understand wow. and go on the same journey that I went through because you know, uh, in terms of, you know, finances, I'm, I was just as illiterate as anybody. And so I'm like, I'm not, I'm not kidding. And like, I was $25,000 in debt two years ago, September, and now I'm more or less retired. Right. So it's like, it, I, I just want people to, to see what's possible. I want like, it, this is a revolution, right. And Initially, I was on board for the revolution, and if the number went up, I was happy with that. But the fact that this was, you know, a big middle finger to the government and the, the existing system, I was all I, I was all about that, and I just wanted people to to get on that train. And so I'm just I just became passionate about this to the point where I just found myself talking to people about it all the time. And when it turned into a call and people, you know, were genuinely curious or, you know, asking questions, 
I just want to make myself available. And so being in Bitcoin has now allowed me just to pursue passion projects where I don't have to clock in anymore. I can do stuff that I'm interested in, uh, which I encourage people to, you know, wrap their head around because you don't have to work, you know, at a job that you don't like and all these things, right? So if I can just pay it forward to that degree where people can sort of get into it and realize what what this really is, then, hey, uh, if, if I can orange pill one person, I'm happy. I would right? imagine it also gives you a sense of peace knowing that you're not in debt anymore and you have savings. So what, what it's done for you emotionally, never mind financially, oh. it's, it's, it's changed the way you're carrying yourself and probably the way you're representing yourself to your friends and your neighbors. It's changed more about you than your finances, correct? D- I'm, a, I'm a different person. Um, there's no doubt about that. Finances, you know, having taken care of those or having, you know, overcome that hurdle that so many people have, um, it just, it, you know, now it's it's just like you just want to give back, you want to share, you want to educate people. Um, I, I find that the Bitcoin community, like on Twitter, is just in general so generous, right? And so I just feel like I want to be, I want to contribute even in a tiny way to that community and be able to do just a fraction of what, you know, these guys even do, you know, for people. Um, every, you know, I, th- I feel like as soon as you wrap your head around it, it makes you want to become part of that and give back and just do your part, mm. right, and pay it forward. And, and it's, a, you know, everyone that gets in the boat, we're all rowing in the same direction, right? right? Like what's good for Bitcoin is good for me, it's good for you, it's good for everyone. And one thing that I want to add, look, um, people are going to say, well, that's a great story, Mike, but uh, you got in early. (laughs) I'm going to tell you that I believe Bitcoin's a better investment today. I got in 2016 at under a a thousand bucks as well. I believe Bitcoin to be a better investment today at whatever price, 60,000, than it was when I got in at under a thousand dollars, okay, it's a better risk reward trade off. Yeah, can you just walk through your thinking on that? For okay, someone who's so yeah, so it? first of all, it's, the network is stronger. The adoption rates are continuing, but mostly because COVID happened, and we have no chance of escaping the debt spiral. Can you walk through the way you do the probability calculation? No, because it's not here. You guys have heard it before. <laughs> no, no, there's uh, a bit of our our audience is growing. Uh, you you want to hear it again? Yeah, okay, yeah. my probability. I have a price target on Bitcoin of over two million dollars of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not going to give you a time because I'll give you a target, but not a time, right? Or I'll give you a trend that the number goes up over time. Uh, My price target of 2 million is very simple, and that's in today's dollars, okay? Uh, Total global assets in the world are 900 trillion US dollars. That includes 400 trillion of debt, a couple of hundred trillion of real estate, a hundred trillion of equities, fine art, gold, you know, commodities, I've forgotten a few, but total global financial assets, 900 trillion. I think, as I said, that Bitcoin, uh, energy is going to get priced in Bitcoin. When that happens, I think that Bitcoin becomes the reserve asset, not reserve currency, the reserve asset of the world. Then if that happens, is it crazy to think that Bitcoin could have a 5% market share? And I think that's not crazy at all, right? 5% of 900 trillion is 45 trillion. What's 45 trillion divided by 21 million? That's over 2 million bucks of Bitcoin. Okay, let's play some probability analysis. Right now it's trading, to help me out, let's just say it's trading at uh, 50,000 bucks. And my price target's 2.5 million, okay? At 2.5 million, dollar price target, the market is telling me at a $50,000 price, there's only a 2% chance that my target in today's dollars comes true. And it's like going to the horse track and you've watched a horse and you're like, this, this horse is pretty special, but the, the odds maker is laying a hundred to one odds. And I'm like, I'm not certain he's going to win the race, but I think it's way more likely than a hundred to one that he's going to lay, that he's going to win the race. What's your odds, Foss? I'd say 25 to one. So if someone's giving you 100 to one odds, and I think it's 20, it should be 25 to one, you buy. Like you buy until the market risk reflects your probability. And in other words, uh, I think the, I can't be 100% certain that Bitcoin hits my price target, but I think it's about 40% likelihood. 
That means that any price under $800,000 of Bitcoin, I'm a buyer. Thank you for sharing that because a lot of, I think that's a way for people to think about it that don't understand that the price is going up and to Mike's point, how they've kind of missed the boat maybe. They have not missed the boat. Yeah. It's a better investment today. And God bless you for sticking through the ups and downs of Bitcoin, but they're rounding errors. I don't know where the next $5,000 price move is and I don't care. Mm -hmm. I do not care. So when you, I, a, a, a couple more interesting things I, I, and then we'll kind of kind of wrap up and um when you think it's going to be the reserve asset of the world and the probability of that, I would agree, is pretty strong. When you think of what the network that Bitcoin is allowing, does that somehow complicate things or change your thinking in any way? The, 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 the network that Bitcoin represents, the monetary network, the lightning network, the way that we're able to use the monetary network well, of as Bitcoin. As you pointed out, like Jock Mahler's, it's, look, it's going to disintermediate. I have, okay, I'm going to hit this in my final thing about El Salvador, but I want to bring this up right now. Okay. I, as you may know, I'm a partner in eight Irish pubs in Montreal. You know that credit card sales, uh, when you do a, as a merchant, when you do a sale in credit card, they basically take one and a half percent fees on the sale. So the restaurant business in itself is if a tough If you're getting business. one and a half, you're pretty good. I think our yeah, fees here, okay. we're getting, yeah, we're getting higher. higher but okay, it doesn't great. matter. Well, let's say it's even two and a half. Yeah, but yeah. here, EBITDA margins, meaning your profitability margins in restaurants, are maybe, if you're really good, about 14%. Which means if they pay in a credit card, that 14% goes down to 11.5% just because the 2.5% that you're paying in merchant fees, right? Do you know what merchant fees on credit cards are in El Salvador? Eight percent, eight percent, guys. This is the reality of the world, okay? And you don't think that paying in Bitcoin and remittances are one thing, that but when re restaurants start getting payment in Bitcoin, where the merchant fee is basically non-existent, all of a sudden their EBITDA margins have increased from a ten percent to an eighteen percent. So, so McDonald's taking Bitcoin in El Salvador, you don't think is a fad? This is this isn't a game. If I was this if I was McDonald's, and I had the chance of increasing my margin by eight percent just because of the payment rail, I think I would tell people, please pay me in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Not only the margin, but it's final settlement. Look on the spot. You're totally right. It's like then then the counterparty risk and there's cl there cl there's not clearing and you're not stuck up in this antiquated because you know credit card balances don't settle immediately. It takes three, three days. Or, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. You understand that. Most people don't understand that it's, while well, it appears instantaneous, the back, and by the way, the operations of the Royal Bank of Canada or all the major banks in Canada are based on technology, IBM technology. You know what the I biggest risk is? You okay, don't know this. The I biggest, used to work okay, there for four okay, months. So the biggest risk is what? That the guy that understands how to program them dies. They Cobalt. do not... Cobalt, correct. correct. J job control language, correct. ACL. When I left correct. school, I worked on Front okay. Street in RBC's okay. IT well, look, department. I will just tell you. I know you. this for a fact. It's okay. the same technology back there. Yes, and it's held together by masking tape and bailing. Spaghetti. Right? Right? So, Spaghetti. You know, it's like, yeah. okay, so I'll just tell you that there's so many reasons that this is going to happen. But again, guys, I want to finish on the El Salvador thing. But the eight, eight, can you imagine 8% merchant fees in Shocking. credit cards in El Salvador? No. Shocking, exactly. Or a little bit almost highway robbery, is it not? Yeah. Okay. Sh share this. To, uh, Jesse, did you have it? Did I interrupt you there? What's the story? Are no, I want you guys to say yours. Oh, oh no, I didn't you're have You're done? A, I yeah. thought you wanted to talk about your book or something. Uh, no, your I Your final I mean, point. We, we can. No, no, I didn't have a point. To okay, okay. So here's what I know. Okay, so I, uh, when I was at Bitcoin Conference in Miami, um, and I had, uh, these guys from uh, Guatemala seeked me out, um, and I was on stage with Jeff Booth. The same stage that six hours later, uh, Jack Mahler's made yep. an announcement that he onboarded a country, right? Huge. Uh, I'm talking, yeah, yeah but I'm, I call out these guys from Guatemala and I say, look, they want to do this thing called a Bitcoin lake around a lake in Guatemala based on the same concept as El Salvador was doing on Bitcoin Beach, right? That was the genesis of El Salvador. They had this community called El Zante. El, El, Zante. El Zante that had a Bitcoin Beach, town, beach, yeah, beach surf surfing town. town. Okay, so look, these guys are like, and I, I said, guys, I'm going to try and give you a shot, shout out on stage. And I gave them a shout out on stage and I hear in the back, Woo! a couple of guys are yelling and everything. Six hours later, Jack Mahler's on boards the country of El Salvador. Well, these guys from Guatemala are a three-hour car drive from, and they got licensed, or not licensed, but uh, paid to be the merchant solution for the Chivo wallet 
in El Salvador, okay? The guy, Jose Limas, is a brilliant, brilliant. He's the Jack Maulers of Central America, okay? There's, I asked them, how many lightning programmers are there really good programmers in the world? They say about 100. I go, how many do you have? He goes, we have six, okay? So he has 6% of the top programmers in the lightning network working in El Salvador, okay? Awesome. I've made a personal investment in his company, and I am really excited about what that's going to do for the future of El Salvador. But most, more than anything, this guy gets payments. He understands. And he's like, Greg, you have no idea what's coming on layer three Bitcoin. It's going to blow your mind. Really? And so Ethereum, for all those people that like Ethereum, I see why it exists. But there's an argument that Ethereum applications are just a test net for eventual Mm -hmm. migration over to the yeah I, I have Bitcoin. a tech my background's tech so when I look at that world um, the way I look at, at Ethereum is that between the years of 1997 in the internet and in about 2004 there was Microsoft used to put out a lot of programs that would really hurt some of the software sales I was competing against and Microsoft would put out stuff in programming languages called Visual Basic there was a uh, there was a tech company that released a, a software program that allowed you to build stuff really quickly called Power Builder and what this did is it allowed you to build computer programs that you could go and put on everybody's desktop really quickly and it would interface with the server in the back end mm -hmm. and because the programming languages were really easy Visual Basic was visual basic programming language. It was a really easy way to create very powerful applications. But the architecture that it was built on was flawed. And I'll never forget, I think it was sometime 1998, 1999, Larry Ellison, I don't know if anyone knows Larry Ellison, yep. billionaire tech founder of Oracle, he sends an email to all of us at Oracle. He basically says, Bill Gates is an idiot and um, I don't think he used those words, but knowing him, maybe he actually <laughs> used that <laughs> word exactly. But he basically said, Bill Gates is an idiot. He's building client server technology when the world and his language was network computing architecture. He said the proper architecture of the world is gonna be network computing architecture, which was basically the internet, thin client, web-based client, and big backend. And for years, these programs that were built with this, this architecture that was easy to build, but not the correct architecture that the world would be built on, took off for six, seven years from the years 1997, 98, 2000, 2001, 2002. But then around around 2003, 2004, web-based architecture started to explode. Salesforce.com came out, NetSuite came out where I went to. It was all thin clients and all your accounting and everything that you were doing was on the back end and you interfaced with a web interface. That was all being built during those six or seven years that these programs were taking off. Interesting. And I look at the way that the Bitcoin network work is evolving today compared to some of the other world in this crypto space as exactly the same. Yep, to I me, I look at it that Bitcoin is playing the long game. Bitcoin is building the under, uh, underlying infrastructure that is the proper infrastructure. But right now, we might not all see it. I think everyone here sees it. But we might not all see it because there's these other sexy, fun things yep. that are built on an architecture that, in, from my view with my context, are not going to last. And I could be 100% wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's when I see the Lightning Network and what's coming out, I'm mm -hmm. like, this is the internet architecture all over again, but on the yeah. monetary So network. this is when I, when I talk to people about Ethereum, I... I tend to use this analogy that, you know, yes, you have the big shiny castle, right? All the sexy fun things you're talking about, but it's built, the castle is built on shifting sands, right? The foundation is not solid. That's the thing that Bitcoin is getting right. It is making sure the 21 million, right? The proof of work. This is what we need to ensure that the foundation is absolutely rock solid. And then you can start to build upwards and get all to the, the fun, sexy things can come on layer two, layer three. You can build upwards. They're still trying to figure out layer one while having all the fun, sexy things. But the layer one isn't set in stone and, you know, the, not even getting into the economics of it. So we I have a story, it, another story, uh, Larry Ellison. So my business partner uh, had designed a software company uh, or founded a software company in Canada and uh, Larry Ellison loved it and wanted to buy the company from my partner. And he comes into the meeting and my partner goes, well, my company's worth like a hundred million dollars. And Larry Ellison goes, it is, you're right. It's worth a hundred million to me not to anybody else. And I'm not paying you 100 million for it, okay? And that's just, I love his idea. And you know, to the right person, the point is uh, scale matters. Um, Bitcoin in its first principles is the only true use of a blockchain. 
yep. right? Decentralization, all these other blockchains can be accomplished more efficiently in some sort of centralized database. But you put blockchain in there, just because you think you're, uh, you know, you're adding value or whatever, this over time will fix itself as well. You, you mentioned layer three. I don't think I'd heard that. What, what, what did you mention layer three? Yeah. What's a layer three? DeFi. All the oh, apps God, that all are, the uh, you know, stuff. all the okay. DeFi and yeah, all yeah, the stuff. So it. stacks and stuff that are already being layer three solutions. Uh, you have VC funds that are purely venture capital based on Bitcoin companies. Mm -hmm. So while you have a digital asset manager out there that says, oh, you have to be diversified and you have to own Bitcoin and Ethereum and Rao Paul says all this stuff. Well, you know, he's a good risk manager, but he's not the techie guy, mm -hmm. right? I'd love to see you on with Raul Paul just chatting back and forth, some of his views and your views. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd be happy to do it. I think, you know, I think we share 95% sure, of the same, yeah. uh, yeah, the same stuff. And uh, But that last 5% changes well, a that, lot. That's what makes markets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what makes yeah, markets, right? Am I, I telling him he's wrong? No, look, do I, uh, am I short Ethereum? No. Mm -hmm. But do I believe that you know, there's a potential for that not to live up to its uh, uh, mm -hmm. billing, if you will. I, again, I don't want hate mail from all you ETH heads out there. No, okay? I think it's uh, just it's an like, observation. You know, no, I think this is just observations. Everyone yeah. can have and their so ideas and thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, if you're a digital asset manager, imagine this. I'm a digital asset manager. And I know that I believe in Bitcoin. But if I just told everyone to buy Bitcoin as a digital asset manager, then they'd say, I'll do it myself. So you got to pretend, you got to be like, I'm adding value with sure. all these other coins and I can do this and, and that. And there's something I did learn from that, those tech days. The Microsoft stuff went up in price like crazy. Okay. Like it did go on a five yeah. or six year run because I knew back in 97, 98, 99 mm -hmm. that the architecture was flawed, but it didn't stop that stuff from running for the next five years until the web architecture came out. Interesting. So some of the Ethereum stuff, this yeah. is the way I look at it. I'm yeah. like, hey, I'm not going to be fooled twice here. Ethereum might go down as another 10X from here. Mm -hmm. It would not surprise me. It's mm -hmm. the same thing I saw before. That's fair. In and terms of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say, in, uh, from what Jesse was mentioning earlier, and we're talking about new layers coming on, right? And it's it, just to draw a very sort of crude picture, which the base layer being the asset, then you've got Bitcoin, the network being this level, you know, layer two, right? With lightning and whatnot, whatever other layers that are being built on it, it's like the, the most important thing that people have to wrap their head around is that where do you want all these applications to be? on some random blockchain or on the most secure network Attaboy. on the planet. That's it, exactly. And right. so if there's anything that's worth doing down the road, because we've had these, you know, we've had the the scale, the scalability sort of conversation. We've seen Bitcoin Cash branch off, fail, right? Because, oh, it's gotta be faster. It's gotta be, you know, uh, it, it's, it's gotta be cheaper. All these things, right? And, and the other 8,000 whatever coins that are out there saying, hey, we're better at this and that. At the end of the day, if there's anything worth doing, it will be built on the most secure network out Same there, and period. Coming back a little bit, I mean, in the similar vein, but coming back to the blockchain and the use case, the best use case for blockchain. So uh, Jan Pritzker, who wrote the book Inventing Bitcoin, had a tweet a while ago. He basically summarized that argument in one tweet. He goes, a blockchain becomes popular, fees go up because more people are using it, transactions start to settle bigger amounts of value, the low value use cases get priced out. The highest value use case of a blockchain is money. Well, Bitcoin is money. Well, congratulations, your blockchain is now an IOU for Bitcoin, or is now a Bitcoin IOU database, but with weaker settlement assurances. <laughs> That's it. There's right. one out here. We'll, we'll get to wrap. I want to share one other thing that Larry Ellison taught me. I remember working there, and I remember the guy had a billion dollar credit line. I could never understand it. I, as a, you know, I was young in my 20s, in awe by the guy. And I always wonder, why does this guy have a billion dollar credit line with a balance of like 950 million on it? And I came to learn many years later that when you have good assets, you don't sell them. And Larry Ellison had the Oracle shares and he put a big fat credit line on there and he was just borrowing money against his Oracle shares. He never sold his great assets. Mm -hmm. So for, for something I kind of live by is that if you have great assets and Bitcoin to me might be the asset of assets, you hold them. You do not sell them. So uh, just something I learned from watching that guy and, and thinking how fool. I remember thinking in my 20s, what a fool. Like I literally thought that of a billionaire. Wow. I thought, what, you know, what a fool this guy has a credit line when he has all this money. He could just have zero dollar balance uh -huh. here on the credit line. Uh -huh. It was a big mind shift for me. As, as, as simple as that might sound for me, that was like I didn't get it. And now I get it. 
acquire great assets. If you're going to have some property, have some property. If you're going to have some Bitcoin, but once you have your good assets, never sell your great assets, right? Anyway, I want to wrap up with just how to reach all of you. So Jesse, do you want to start your book, your Twitter handle, yeah, website? Sh sure thing. So uh, on Twitter, at Jaber, J-A-Y-B-E-R-J-A-Y. And I think, I hope a lot of listeners know the book, uh, Magic Internet Money, a book about Bitcoin. I was interviewed by you with, with Greg, obviously, because mm. Greg is the, uh, the ringleader here. <laughs> Um, a while back, so that's a great episode to listen to. I, when when did we do that one? I can't when, remember. Uh, uh, my memory's Mar shot. May? Me. Could it have been May? It I think sure. it was May. We'll go with that. Yeah, we'll yeah with that. early summer. Early summer. It's on the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you yeah, go yeah. to rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash podcast, you will find Jesse Berger on there multiple times now. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, the book's available on Amazon. I have a little website, uh, magicbitcoinbook.com. Um, it's a great, you mentioned the sort of A to Z of Bitcoin. I, I'm trying to cover a myriad of different topics about Bitcoin, letting, you know, people that are unfamiliar with it just dip their toe into, you know, the vast array of topics that Bitcoin touches. You do a great job of it in that book and, as well. And I try to do it in as friendly a way as possible. It's a very approachable book. It's, you know, you can just flip through one page. Every page is its own little siloed argument. So it's not, I try not to be too intimidating, just very approachable book. Anyway, so that's where you can Thank find you. me and that's what I've done. Thank you. Greg. Yeah, great book. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe strongly in it as a, uh, a core of uh, your reading material that you need to. Uh, learning about Bitcoin uh, is a, a thousand hour education. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so you have all these experts that say Bitcoin won't make it and they, well, I've studied for four hours. Oh, you have, have you? Okay. So, so like, it's that, it's that you, meme. You know, I'm new to Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm here right. to fix it. Yeah, exactly. So, so you got it, but, but let's take a step back in terms of, uh, Personal finance, uh, you brought that up about uh, you couldn't believe that uh, Larry Ellison had that line of credit. I'll go out on the limb here and tell your listeners, don't pay down your debt. Why would you ever pay down debt when interest rates are at the lowest rates in history? In fact, you may not have enough debt, <laughs> okay? And I'm not telling you to go out and leverage yourself and put it in Bitcoin, but maybe you put a bit of it in Bitcoin. You put a bit of it in other hard assets because what is debt? Debt is a contract that you, let's say, borrow $1,000 and in 10 years, you'll pay that $1,000 back. But the purchasing power of that $1,000 in 10 years is going to be a fraction of what it was worth today. The person that's an idiot is the person that's lending you the money. Not you for taking the money. <laughs> it's the person that's lending you the money. Oh, the irony. And you need to take advantage of that. So my whole life has been spent in risk markets. Uh, Jeff Booth uh, provided me a very nice compliment just the other day. He said, uh, I said, uh, I was on this podcast and I tweeted out, uh, 45 minutes with uh, Jeff Booth is uh, equivalent to one college degree and 45 minutes with Foss is like dental surgery. And he, <laughs> and he, he came back and he goes, Foss is t way too humble and he's also hilarious, uh, but he has w learned a lot from me as a risk manager. And I appreciate that because look, um, what have I done? Uh, I survived 30 years in markets that generally take you and chew you and spit you out in about a five year. There's very few people that survive 30 years, okay? And if you do, it's probably because you did something right. And doing something right includes admitting when you've been wrong. And the biggest problem I have with risk managers out there that claim they're risk managers is that they stick with an outdated thesis and they're gonna go to their grave. And I've actually seen people get carted off the trading floor when the pressure of a, of a, uh, a trade going against them actually caused a heart attack, okay? Oh and so that's God. some of the efficient things that happen in markets, okay? The guy that's too stupid, fixes its own problem. I mean, okay. it sounds like, brutal like, laughing, but, but, I mean, but what it, can but, you do? But you're yeah, there. Yeah. It's, it happened right in front of me. The gurney went right across <laughs> in front of me. I'm like, okay, well, look, markets are efficient. It's very interesting, right? So anyway, I'll just, and I'm not laughing, by the way. It was, And he did not die, so thank goodness for that. Um, I'll just tell you, uh, trading risk is all about trading probabilities. And we talked about, you know, that probability analysis. Um, I can't be 100% certain, ladies and gentlemen, but this is the best, I will say this, it's the best risk adjusted opportunity I've ever seen in 30 years of managing risk. And people say, oh yeah, well, what's managing risk? And I'll just tell you, it's when you go to work in 2007, 2008, and actually March 2009, when the world 
was ending. Okay, so I don't care people say it didn't end. You have no idea how close it was to ending. Everybody was insolvent. Every single financial institution was insolvent, and the Fed did what they had to with these things called troubled asset relief programs or TARP and all this. But we blew our load. We cannot do that again, okay? We have... We can't even taper now. Markets around the world will collapse if the U.S. tries to taper. So. Oh, what, yeah. look, what happens when U.S. dollar uh, appreciates around the world? All emerging economies get destroyed. And tapering would, equivalent, would be the equivalent of increasing the value of the U.S. dollar. All fiats are melting. The U.S. dollar is just the one that melts the slowest when you stop tapering. Can't do it, guys. It's only math. Borrow money. Be smart and prepare for situations where cycles have now gotten shorter and shorter, okay? Because it took three years for 2000, the, the great financial crisis to, to, to settle itself. The COVID crisis settled itself in about three months the, in financial, in financial yeah, that's world. That's a good way to think okay? of it, yeah. And the next one's going to settle itself even shorter, meaning it's going to crash faster. So how fast did COVID go? Like, I mean, compared to the great financial crisis, COVID was a, 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 a absolute elevator down, right? The great financial crisis was you were taking the escalator down, right? The COVID crisis was the elevator you took down. Yeah, the that, next was, one, that was back in March 2020 correct, we talked about, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's why it is a better risk-adjusted trade mm -hmm. to get into Bitcoin now. Because we've, mathematical certainty, we don't have an escape. Your research paper. Um, uh -huh. Can you read the name off it for me? Uh, Greg Foss. You walked right into that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why every fixed time in, why every fixed time in income investor needs to consider Bitcoin as portfolio insurance. So that paper is a fantastic read if you want to dive deeper into what Greg just discussed. You can get that at rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash Foss, F-O-S-S. -S. That will take you directly to that paper. It is a fantastic read of Greg's story, kind of like your life's journey almost through the markets mm -hmm. and then the way you view Bitcoin. So anyone who's into what Greg's world is all about or has been about, that's a great, uh, great paper. So, and I thank you guys for publishing it because I think it's been downloaded quite a few times. I we mean, should actually get people, the number. Well, he, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's your page on our website is one of the most popular pages on the website. Yeah. So uh, well, thank there, you. There and, you and I, but I appreciate that because look, I, I, but it's some people on Twitter, right? They want everything. And they're like, can you please explain, you know, this whole thing about how we can't taper? And I'm like, you think I'm going to do that in 45 words or less? I just, I just punch up this. Uh, rock star inner circle and I just say read this and people literally and this is it, it, I'm, I'm flattered okay I can't believe I've had this a number of times I can't believe I took four years of university and I learned more from your paper <laughs> than I did in taking four years of finance well Greg I've, I've read a lot of, since 2008 Nick and I have both read a lot of books on finance mm -hmm. the financial world monetary policy mm -hmm. central banking system the whole works I had to read, I, there was, I don't know which chapter it was, I think I had to read it three times because it was so dense that I had to digest Right, it was probably on the pricing, how you price I, bonds. Correct, and, and, but it's correct. only math, and look, it's, and, and if funny thing is, if you understood physics, lots of people don't, but if you understood, understood, understood physics in grade 11, you'd be a great bond trader, okay? And uh, that's because acceleration is convexity and velocity is duration, and pricing a bond is, duration and convexity and physics is velocity and acceleration okay and what is a debt spiral velocity and acceleration okay so bitcoin solves the debt spiral both of them are only mathematics and uh, i don't want to get too granular but i i am now writing for bitcoin magazine i've put out two uh two publications Sweet. that and and actually yeah. thank you and uh, you know what but and i I'm, I'm a paid writer and i'm not i actually haven't taken any payment they've offered to pay me and i haven't taken any payment yet and i'm debating whether i'll do, uh, donate it to the core devs or i already c uh, contributed to the core dev community so um anything i make from that will find its way to the core devs, uh, you nice. know, through, through all these, uh, all, all these various ways of, uh, contributing to the core devs. But, uh, there's some unbelievable people in the Bitcoin community, incredibly intelligent. Larry Leopard, I wanted to mention a specific shout out to my friend, Larry Leopard. Maybe just before you go on, if anyone out there has benefited from Bitcoin and they do want to, uh, donate to core devs, bit, bitcoin devlist.com. 
just that, like just like it sounds. Perfect. Bitcoin D E D list. That, oh, that's Matt Odell. That, that Matt Odell. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So I do it nice. through GitHub and uh, and and all that. That's but, just uh, an easier yeah, way. To, yeah. yeah. So so here's here's what I wanted to mention about the, the who I've met down in. Um, in uh, Bretton Woods, I met a gentleman, Larry Leppard, okay, Lawrence Leppard, who's a gold guy, who actually is giving a conference uh, to gold investors at the end of October that he uh, asked me to pre-read his speech. I'm very flattered, okay? Um, this is a guy who was a perfect risk manager who understood that you shouldn't, you should accept gold and Bitcoin and hope and, and it's like going to the horse track and saying, hey, I'm betting on a, quint you know, a trifecta. Uh, you don't need to say who's going to win it. You just need to pick the three horses that are going to win. And he is markedly different from those other gold bugs out there that actually pretend they know anything about Bitcoin and that it's not going to succeed. So a shout out to Larry Leopard, who I met down in uh, Bretton Woods. He's in, in Boston. Uh, Around Christmas time, I hope to go back to Boston to settle up a bet with another gold bug that I met down in uh, in in Boston. Uh, sorry, in Bretton Woods, who uh, we have a price target, a bet on a price target for Bitcoin by the year end. And I could give a shit where whether I win or lose. I just want to have dinner with these guys, and we'll look up Jason Lowry when we're down there because uh, there is so many smart people in this space. And you learn so much by just sitting at a table and listening to experiences, including the people. You have to listen to people that go against your thesis, okay? Because the best risk managers don't look at research that confirms their bias, which is natural human. Oh, you're going to be so smart. You own Bitcoin. It's going to this price target. Read the research that says Bitcoin is the Ponzi. And then when you poke holes in that research and realize they don't understand what they're talking about, then you're comfortable with your own thesis okay so that's what good risk management's all about can i just mention something on that specific mm -hmm. point that's what made me go m pretty much all in on, on bitcoin is when i was listening to peter schiff remember my background was understanding gold all right when i under when i heard him defend gold and his arguments and i knew his arguments maybe better than he knew them right and knew that his arguments were weak that was my you know how you, there's that comment that you should never meet your heroes or whatever? That was my realization that, oh my gosh, the, this this particular person that I was listening to on the gold front uh -huh. didn't understand what he was talking about in this Bitcoin world. Right. And it made me, it, it gave me the confidence to just go much more aggressively into Bitcoin. As weird as that sounds. Yeah. Well, I Peter I, McCormick, I, you may or may not know, I, I was invited on Peter McCormick's show to debate Peter Schiff. And uh, McCormick was on my side, and I think we did a pretty good job of getting the point across that Peter Schiff is a horrible risk manager. And Peter Schiff at one point responded, I don't care. <laughs> so I called him out as being a horrible risk manager, and he goes, I don't care. And I'm like, wait a minute, your fiduciary responsibility to your unit holders is for you to be a good risk manager and you just told me you don't care that you're a, a horrible risk manager and he actually did so the as the bitcoin world does and they they, they did a quick 60 seconds because i started the i started the debate off that was Peter, a great I, clip i know what you're it? talking yeah, about yeah. the guy goes <laughs> and then 30 seconds later and but it was really 60 minutes later okay but then and for those people who don't know i need to slow down and explain this what <laughs> happened was Greg starts this chat with Peter Schiff and Peter McCormick <laughs> by saying, I'm really going to take it easy. And I don't know if you, you know, I'm just going to be gentle. We're going to have a cordial discussion here. I will not get aggressive on anything. And then this little clip cuts and it says, you know, 30 seconds later, and you just see Foss going at Schiff <laughs> aggressively. So it was just, uh, yeah, it was a great little clip. Well, I, I didn't realize you guys had seen it. But see, all I'm saying is this, look, I've done this for 30 years. Like it's, I didn't realize the lack of, people out there that have really been able to experience all the stuff I've experienced. And uh, the the truth is, every, I'm spiritual. I've told you guys this. Everything happens for you. Uh, no, anyway, listen, um, uh, you meet such great people um, and you realize, as Jesse said, we are rowing in the same direction. It's very simple. Why? Guys, look, I've worked hard in my life. I'm privileged. Uh, I don't need Bitcoin price to go up, but my kids need an insurance policy. And Bitcoin is my insurance policy, okay? That simple. It is the best protection against continued deteriorating fiat credit quality. Never seen anything like it. I need people to understand it's for the benefit of the kids.
Your Twitter, Greg's Twitter handle. If you're going to follow Twitter, you, you uh, follow Greg on Twitter. You should be. If you're not, it's at Foss Greg Foss. So on Twitter, at Foss Thanks. Greg Foss. Yep. Thanks for that, Greg. Awesome. Mike, wrap us up here. Where can people find you on Mondays, not Fridays? On Monday <laughs> nights, what time on Monday? How do people join? Where's the website? What's your Twitter handle? So I've got a Telegram group for anyone who has the app. Uh, it's just BitcoinBullets.ca. Um, on there, I will post links, videos, updates, news, and the info for the Monday night call, um, which I'll, I have my um, Zoom link is on there. So BitcoinBullets.ca for the Telegram group. Uh, on uh, Twitter, I'm Bitcoin underscore bullets. On Twitter, at Bitcoin underscore bullets. And if yep. you're listening to this while you're driving, all of these links for Jesse Berger's book and his Twitter handle, Greg Foss's Twitter handle, and his research paper, Mike's Twitter handle, and your Telegram group, we will have that all at rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash podcast. You'll find links to everything there. Guys, I just really want to thank you, Mike, for what you're doing, because you don't need to be sitting down on Monday educating people the way you are and helping one by one. Like it is huge. So thank you. No, seriously. As as somebody here who wants everyone to benefit of for the next few years, I thank you personally. I mean, you're doing heroes work here. So thank you, Greg, for everything that you're doing, teaching all of us. Because sometimes I think when you have 30 years experience managing risk, you maybe take for granted your level of knowledge, and then you meet us, and you're like, how how do these guys not understand physics and how it applies to the credit market? <laughs> well, yeah, and we're like, Greg, yeah, we don't get so. Thank uh -huh. you, Greg, for what you're doing, and Jesse, for you putting your thoughts in a book where you can pick up any page and turn to that page and get a useful bit of information. It is a powerful book. So, Magic Internet Money, a, uh, a book about Bitcoin. I just thank each of you for doing what you're doing and coming on this podcast and sharing. And back so at you, you, right, guys? Yeah, yeah back sure. at you. You guys just started me off, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's crazy that I have. Uh, you know, the opportunity to get on stage at some pretty... So I'm speaking at Mark Moss's event in uh, Miami at the beginning of November. It's called the Disruptors Conference, and there's some big, big people speaking alongside, you know, little old me. But uh, it, it happens slowly and then suddenly, all of a sudden. So it's, awesome. it's been amazing to watch. Uh, I yeah. appreciate it. Well, it's with help from the Canadian community, but also, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of, a little bit of hard work. Uh, there's an expression, right? People who are lucky tend to be hard workers. So you make your own luck, you, you, gotta, luck, you yeah. gotta work hard and nothing is easy. But I will tell you that every single bit of research you do on Bitcoin is so enlightening. And you, I, I honestly think there's a chance that Satoshi was an alien. And I say that tongue in cheek, but it is such a brilliant technology. It's almost like it was imported from another world. You may think I'm goofy. No, I'm not going to just say no. He just destroyed no. his credibility yeah. after this whole conversation. <laughs> we'll leave it there. He just next destroyed time. it all. It's, More it's, next it's, time. Because Pomp asked me, he goes, do you believe in aliens? And I do. <laughs> oh, I'm just it, not it, certain. I'm not certain. It's, they a have, it's a probability. It's a thing. probability analysis. Okay. Yeah, I'm not I, certain they visited Earth, but I actually think I they have I didn't know we were well. going down okay, the UFO. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms.